Uh, now, first of all, uh, the sound design for the movie. I could effectively feel the bullets hitting my body when I saw yeah. it last night. The sound design is amazing. Yeah, well, when the um, when we were doing the film, I think, because basically the film is based on my love of Hong Kong action cinema of the late 80s and 90s, John Woo and Hard Boiled and The Killer and City of Fire by Ringo Lam. So, and all those films are kind of, you know, they're almost like a bullet, a ballet of bullets. And that's what I love, the sort of choreography. So it's kind of, it, it, I didn't design it like the sort of Born Ultimatum film, it's all shaky camera. It's kind of much more choreographed and coming wide. And one thing I said to the sound designer is, Every time a bullet, a gunfight comes, I want the power of these bullets to really hit the audience. And he knew this guy, this kind of mad gun fanatic who lives in the Swedish mountains. Kind of, I, I, I've never met him, but I just imagine he's got a beard and like, lives in this wooden hut in the mountains. And he kind of is a gun nut and he would go off and he, would rec he recorded separately every single weapon and bullet hitting the floor and the tinkle of the kind of the, the cartridges. And he went and recorded them in the mountains. So yeah, this amazing sort of powerful echo. And then we got all these sound designs back and we put, let, fed them into the film and we're like, God, it's amazing. It feels so powerful and strong. And you're right, yeah, we kind of, this great guy. And since then, a few people have watched the film and are like, I want to use that guy for my film because he's, he's great. When somebody told you they knew a guy that lives in the forest who's a gun expert and will send you a tape, <laughs> well, you're kind of a little bit worried about that. Yeah, well, there was this kind of constant joke going around that he must, like, God knows, I don't even want the sound camera because he might kind of hunt me down or something. I just imagine, he'll just appear he will out. He you and he will kill you. He'll just appear out the paisley wallpaper and put a knife to my neck. <laughs> <laughs> now it's great to see uh, James and Mark with guns in their hands again. I mean, they always make stone cold but excellent action men, and especially with James, people are always kind of a bit surprised by that because he is still quite baby faced, but he rocks it. Yeah, and he's. Um, I think what it is is James is quite. He's a physical actor, and so we never really used a stunt double in the film. We had the stunt double standing by throughout the whole movie and for driving. So we kind of used it more in the driving, but all those stuff you see in the film where Jamie's sliding along the bar, firing guns or sliding over cars, or he did it, he did everything, he did, he did everything. I think there's maybe a one or two things where it's just a little bit too dangerous for him and insurance purposes. But I think it comes from his physicality, and I think he was, I think when he was younger, I remember having a conversation that he was involved in dance, do you know what I mean? So he's kind of the way he moves his body, and he's got, he's, you know, he's powerful, and he's. So yeah, and then Mark as well is obviously just solid, solid actor as well. I mean, I mean with James especially, uh, he, as you say, he's, you know, he has that sort of that dancer quality. But Mark's Cheshire Cat snaggletoothed grin yeah. can be brilliantly friendly, but also terrifying. Yeah, yeah. That is an immense face that Mark's got, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's um, funny enough when you chat to Mark. The first time he played a villain was in The Long Firm, and it's a story he'll tell. And they didn't think that he had it to play had it in him to play a villain and all the kind of people behind the show were like well, we don't know if Mark Strong should be right for this so he was like no 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 we, we kind of he'll be great at this and he played that villain in the long film he played it amazingly and very well and he got amazing reviews and then since then he's like people think oh we can't see him you know they see him as the villain and he's like, he's like oh god I should make <laughs> but I the city is kind of an additional character here I mean you make London look amazing it's that brilliant thing between not being too sort of gritty and typecast gangster London and it's also not the Richard Curtis rose tinted London's fantastic and Lo the palace is right next to Downing Street is right next to the London Eye it's a, it, was that important to you to create the character? Yeah definitely well I've, I, saw, I don't live too far from the city myself so and I go jogging around Canary Wharf and I know all those kind of nooks and crannies and I see these amazing angles and I think some, a problem that a lot of modern British filmmakers do, and I, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not knocking anyone, but it's just they quite make for quite parochial, grey feeling films. And I wanted to make something where it felt like Tokyo or, or Hong Kong. And I called it Neon Noir. And it was like not being too literary of London and doing the London Eye and Big Ben, but just using sort of glass, chrome, steel, neon, brushed concrete, and just using a different texture of surfaces and a different palette. And hopefully we kind of created a different look for the film. And people who watch it say that the city looks amazing. And a couple of guys from your debut feature, what was that, four four years ago? Yep, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. They're recasting know. this. Was it important to, to bring them through or was it just that they Yeah, picked? no, I always wanted to try and bring the, say, like, some of the cast I worked with before. My wife is in the film who's in Shifty as well. You know, my wife plays Peter Mullen's wife in, 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 in Welcome to the Punch and there's Danny Mays and Riz and um, Jay Simpson plays the barber, do you know what I mean, in, in the movie as well. And, I, and Jason Maz is in there. But yeah, I just wanted to bring some of my own crew. Couldn't get Riz in there because he was off shooting, shooting The Reluctant Fundamentalist, but tried to, I know, selfish, selfish, selfish. So I had to bit, do a bit of a shuffling, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Talking of Hollywood, uh, you've done two British movies. You have not yet, as far as I know, decided to sort of cash in your chips and go yep. off to Hollywood. You could rock the ass out of a Die Hard 6, <laughs> yeah. and Mark would make a brilliant villain. He would play a brilliant villain, yeah. I don't know if I'd want to... Uh, yeah, maybe I just... 
can can you could you bring it back? Can you bring it back? The Die Hard series. It was a film that made me want to become a director. It was Die Hard. So the, the first Die Hard and you know, Leaf of Weapon and Predator and John McTiernan, the amazing action director who went through that period of making Hunt for October, Die Hard, um, Predator. And I don't know, I don't know if I'd want to touch it because it's one of those films that I look up to and I, I hold it in such high regard that I don't know if I'd want to come in and do something with a sequel. It's always difficult with that, isn't it? When something is so fantastic and a lot of directors get the chance to do that kind of thing is to pick up a franchise and run with it. It is exceptionally hard because of the heritage. I think if... You know, if there's anything, if there's a legacy that I can create, I'd like to try and create my own Die Hard, a new generation of action film that has its own um, sequel. Do you know what I mean? So I'd like to, and I've got some fresh material and fresh ideas in my head, and I'm writing plenty of new scripts, and I've got some new ideas coming out there, and so see what happens.